welcome to Season 7, Episode 31 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Wednesday the 29th of October and we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news and in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat thing on the website and in the hash UUPC IRC channel. I'm Laura and joining me this week are Tony. Good evening. Hello, Alan. Hiya. Hiya. And Mark. Hello. And how are you, Mark? I'm all right. I'm in charge this week. Yep. Ooh, uh... Uh-oh. And I'm in charge of him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Kind of blind lead in the blind. <laughs> Looking over my shoulder, providing sage advice. Yep. Excellent. So you're on the ones and twos then, are you, Mark? What does that mean? The buttons. Yeah. Yes, those. He's using his lingo. He again. is. <laughs> does that, does that mean on and off by any chance? No, just uh, like... I know oh, that's one and zero, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it shows how much I know. You're a binary. I thought, you, I thought you were the developer out of all of us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, At least you code. can code. <laughs> uh, how is everyone? Good, yeah, thank good. You. Yeah, pretty yeah. good. Pretty so good. this is the first one we've had everyone back properly for a while, isn't it? We had one before I went on holiday. Oh, that's yeah, right. It was only yeah. last yeah. Mark was sunning himself Has in anyone, speedos. Anyone got any more? Ho- oh. Anyone got any more holiday books <laughs> between now and the end of the year? Nope. No. Good. No. So no excuses for not being here. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, we'll think of something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you'll be on the buttons next time, Alan. Don't worry. No, I'm yeah. doing my absolute best not to be. Because you know what happens when I control things? <laughs> we lose episode. Like <laughs> Episode remember, 30. Remember epi- that one last episode year? Episode 30. The oh, missing dear. episode. Ooh. Every so often, it's got about seven people who've tried to download it from the, <laughs> uh, the website. <laughs> Do you know, I was actually uh, looking on eBay for, a, uh, for an iRiver a replacement oh, iRiver oh, MP3 the player. Yeah, so that I could transplant the hard drive out of mine and into a, and they're actually really expensive is yeah. it because they're they're like <clears throat> rare gold facts of technology yeah i think so yeah that's, that's the way i like to think about it anyway. yeah anyway shall we get on with it yes. okay. yeah And it's time for the news. So, first up in the news discussion segment this week, uh, Microsoft OpenTech has founded Kayanusha. Kayanusha. Something like that. A Chinese group to promote the use of open source. The group includes representation from over 20 organizations, including some familiar names like Mozilla and Ubuntu Kylin. Um, So, this is interesting news, isn't it? Is it? Well, it says it must be interesting. It's made it into our show. <laughs> well, this is this is you know, Microsoft pushing forward with an open source initiative in in China specifically. In China, yes. yes, which is interesting as a, as a a market where lots of people pirate Windows. <laughs> yes, um, particularly Windows XP in China. Mm-hmm. Um, Microsoft are pushing a, a open source alternatives. So, or, well, when you say open source, do they mean open source software that sits on top of Windows? Well, I mean they're not. They're not. I don't think it's they're meant to um, specifically promote particular open source software solutions. They're promoting open source as a sort of a, general concept, a general concept, a way of developing software, providing education on how people can develop software in an open source fashion, and so right. on. Is that a bit like greenwashing, where green is open source? Open washing, it's usually called in that context. Is it yeah. really? Wow, yeah. it's actually got a name. That's the thing. Know. Yeah, that, a that thing. is the thing. Open washing. Yes. Are they open washing? Um, well, I don't know. I'm sure they, they will be and have been accused of that. But then they also do lots of, I mean, Open, Microsoft Open Tech do a lot of work around, um, you know, contributing to the Linux kernel to get um, Linux and other open source stuff running on Azure. So obviously oh, it's yeah. stuff that's in their commercial interest, yes, but it is actually them releasing open source code and using open source software. Speaking of hmm. Azure, uh, there was a recent uh, presentation given by their new CEO, and he put up a slide that said Microsoft and then a heart and then Linux. Oh, which goes. He also against... said something interesting about how much women should get paid, didn't he? Yeah, that was something else. <laughs> yeah. We talked about that we last time. We talked about that last time. Yeah, you were on holiday. Uh, uh, yeah, but it, it, it seems like there's a, a theme going on here that they are uh, relenting a little bit and uh, maybe embracing open stuff a yeah. bit more. Well, as you say, in their commercial interests to do so, particularly with cloud platforms. But um, mm. yeah, well, good old Microsoft, eh? Mm. What's Whoa, who thought you'd ever say that? <laughs> <laughs> I can hear Fab um, going mental right now. <laughs> um, in, in other news, 
which uh, is less favorable for, for Microsoft. Semiconductor manufacturer FTDI shipped an update for its drivers through the Windows Update service that identifies software-compatible clones of their serial communication chips in connected hardware and disables them by overwriting the device ID. Nice. So huh. if you're if you're using some kind of I don't know Internet of Things device or some other device that's connected to your computer and the uh, the chip on that device happens to not be a genuine FTDI part, which you may not have decided because you just bought the thing, yeah. And the people who made the thing put a non genuine FTDI chip in there. Uh, if you'd installed this update, it would have bricked your device, but not necessarily the entire device, but your communication channel to the device. Which is effectively which, yes. bricking the if device. It's, if it's like an Arduino, which you have to program by plugging it in over USB, right? Then uh, yeah, which pretty is, much useless. Yeah, I mean they they see it as protecting their intellectual property because they put a lot of R and D into making these FTDI chips, and along comes some other company who just basically rip them off and copy the the chip and make their own version of the chip, uh, and if you're making some cheap Internet of Things thing, you may choose to use a cheap. Uh, pirate FTD and some of them even have the FTDI logo on the chip <laughs> so they're being a bit, a bit cheeky yeah, yeah. but that's as but a consumer still not, yeah, it's still not an excuse for them to brick consumers devices who may have bought them in perfectly good faith yeah. right exactly I have a question right what is an FTDI chip um, so FTDI are the company and they make a chip which everyone calls FTDI chip because that's the one thing they're most famous for I think um, and for like example another. it can be used to um bridge usb to like a serial port on a chip on a board so you may have an arduino board and it may have an ftdi chip on it so that you could plug a usb cable into it because you know not every processor has native usb support so it's essential that you put a chip on there that has okay and that's what the 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 ftdi chip is a usb bridge if you like right and apparently people have made copies of this yes as a licensed design, I mean, you know, no, no, ah, right, yes. as a complete rip off, <laughs> right. Yeah. In the same way that you know, there any 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 number of chips uh, are ripped off and made in in uh, fabrication plants all around the world, many in China, um, and often they are made by the company <laughs> by the fabricating yeah. plant that makes the original as well. They just let the 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 plant run on for a few more hours or an extra day or so and churn out another 100,000 parts and then sell those on the grey market. Uh-huh. Interesting. But the the flip side is if you're if you're someone who makes a, a an internet of things thing or an Arduino or whatever and you're trying to keep costs low and it's hard to buy a genuine FTDI chip, buying one of the, you know, the rip-offs is Possibly attractive, um, yeah. maybe. But anyway, they've withdrawn the update eventually after everyone complained, and they put a blog post out saying, "Not really." Actually, they didn't actually apologise at all. They just said they w- they want to defend their property. So, if your device has been made useless <laughs> thanks to the updates, even though they've now you know withdrawn it, can you do anything? You could. There was a, a solution where you could plug it into a Linux device with a patch. Which let it read it, even though we let it access the device, even though the device ID had been overwritten, and then reset and then the, device reset the device ID. Right. Uh, okay. Yay! Linux to the rescue again. <laughs> yeah. I noticed... Not picks all over. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that um, Russ Dill of Texas Instruments did submit a patch to make the Linux drivers Do behave the in the same thing as the presumably uh, Windows drivers. Yes. yes. Um, and disable chips <laughs> that weren't genuine. Wait, Greg, Greg Curry Hartman referred to it as performance art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a giant joke, really. Yes. Well, one thing that uh, you know Linux has always been good at is actually improving on the uh, <laughs> equivalent device drivers. <laughs> well, you know, we we do like to copy uh, the uh, the Windows world, as uh, uh, Fab brought up at uh, our camp. That yeah. maybe the open source always community is is always catching up. So yeah. yeah, maybe that's us catching up. Okay, moving on. And this week, which would be this week that you're listening to it if you download it straight away <laughs> it's, we, we or you could just say Monday, the date 7th of October <laughs> October 27th this week um, <laughs> it's Get Geek Mental Help Week um, so the campaign features a week long series of blog posts podcasts events and other resources about mental health issues and how to help people with such issues and you can find out more at geekmentalhealth geekmentalhelp.com 
Is that right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Not mentalhealth.com. Yes. I, th- I thought this was like implying that you have to be, you know, have to have mental health issues to be a geek. But it's actually, <laughs> it's actually for people who yes. you know, are geeks, are geeks and, and may not need have, help. Addresses, have addressed their yes. own mental health Or people issues. who have and want to you know, talk about their experiences and yep. maybe give advice to other people who might be experiencing issues. Awesome. Is that that we did a we talked about a guy who was doing a was it a Kickstarter or Indiegogo to raise funds to go around and talk about this kind oh, yes. of thing? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. That was an open source guy. I can't remember what his name was, but that he was in open source and he wanted to go to open source conferences to do just this sort of thing. Yes, you're right. That was really cool. I don't mm. know if he's involved. Mm. But yeah, there's yeah. quite quite a lot of um, I, I sort of spotted it at the beginning of this week and looked again today, and there's loads of stuff on there, loads mm. of podcasts, loads of blog posts. Oh, cool. So, right. Yeah. Ah, good so stuff. Geekmentalhelp.com. And next up, Google have released a new email client called Inbox. That's an inventive name yes. nobody's ever used before. <laughs> Hello, Dropbox. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, so the the features of Inbox include bundles, which group similar emails together, highlights, which give focus to important information, and reminders. So you can set your own reminders, um, kind of like some sort of calendaring application, I suppose. Or like it, Google Calendar. Or, yeah, you know, any other email client with an integrated calendar. So has anybody tried it? No. Nope. No. Is it web-based? Yep. Well, there's mobile as well. So you can use it on your mobile device. Right, so do you have to mm-hmm. do you have to have a Gmail account to use it, or does it just use SMTP and IMAP and it's standard Gmail. things? It's Gmail. It's based on Gmail. Okay. So you really have to have a Gmail account. And, you know, and you You've have, got a Gmail account? I have, but I don't use it. Uh, so um, You don't use your Gmail account? Not my at gmail.com account. No, I use a Google Apps for Domain Google Mail account. Right, and you use, oh, so you use that through Gmail, but you don't use it through Inbox? No, because you need to have an invite to use <laughs> This inbox. is as confusing as the date. <laughs> so in order to use Inbox, you have to get an invite. Oh, okay. And I right. don't have an invite. Oh, it's like one. Gmail back in the day. Exactly. I remember that. But, it, so, but I don't have an invite. But also, even if I did have an invite, I wouldn't be able to use it because they've only released it for people with a Gmail address, I not see. for people with Google Apps for Domains. Right. Google okay. Mail. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure it will be more widely spread and uh, uh, put its tentacles into uh, all other parts of uh, Google, <laughs> you know, as always. Yeah. I don't know. I I actually don't want to try it because I don't. Are you, are you happy with Gmail and? No, I'm not. No. But I I don't I don't. Do you fear change? <laughs> <laughs> this feels like a mental health issue that I really should talk about. Yeah. yeah. Um, Be careful. They might put quotas. Right. I I I I'm getting annoyed with the amount that I'm reliant on Google, and I'm I yes. don't want to get. You should more run your reliant. own cloud. Yeah, I should. I should. <laughs> Well, it's not so much a cloud, more a box in your bedroom. Yeah. Ask me again about <laughs> how much my uh, how badly my ButterFS volume failed over the week, <laughs> last week. You mean our... your, your, your ButterFS volume, which you always, uh, you know, talk I'm about how amazing it is. Yeah, yes. I'm always yeah. doing checks. Yeah, anyway. And that you've you know, been a vocal advocate for. And then I saw a post on Google Plus where Alan said, ButterFS really broke and I'm, yes. you know, can't get my data back. Yes. <laughs> it, uh, I'm but... not so much of a fan as I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what I said. Although a little bit more, yeah. Grumpy. Grumpy, yeah. It's a anyway, family friendly show. Moving on. <laughs> Tony, what's up next? There's an Indiegogo campaign to port Sailfish OS app um, called Meta Kulu, which is a client for messaging service WhatsApp to Ubuntu. The app is written in QML, which is the same technology as apps for Ubuntu phones. Um, and basically, the campaign is seeking to raise enough money to provide the Meta Kulu developer with an Ubuntu phone. <laughs> um, the minimum funding required is €120 Euros for development to begin, but the target is €500. Euros. I guess that means €120 Euros is enough to buy a phone, and then €500 Euros is enough to buy, know, him. buy him six phones or something. Or carry on, motivating him to carry on developing oh, yes. an app. Paying him money. Yeah. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be nice to be... Yeah, be a developer and get paid to do the stuff, you know. Yeah. So basically, this is to bring WhatsApp to Ubuntu phone. Well, no, you have to be very careful with WhatsApp because they are somewhat litigious and they don't like people using their brand name, um, especially for apps which aren't their brand name, if you know what I mean. So making Uh, third-party apps, you you can use their API because they can't limit that. It's pub. Black so yeah, is it a public API or is this reverse engineered uh, I think and they can't stop API. you? Right. <laughs> okay. Or it's been reverse engineered, but either yeah. way, it's now public. Um, 
but he, it exists on Selfish. So if you buy a, a Yola Selfish phone, yeah. um, this app, Bitakulu, which actually I think is Finnish for what's up, yeah. what's app or something yeah. like yeah. that, or yeah. what's going on or something like that. Um, so you can install that uh, on the phone and use it, but because it's not an official app, it's a little bit dangerous. And oh, you mean you can install it on Ubuntu phones? So no, no, on oh, the right. self. I said right. if you buy a selfish phone, you can install it on the selfish phone. Right. Sorry, but the the problem is that it, sometimes you get blocked on WhatsApp for whatever reason. So you contact them and you tell them my account's been blocked. And I was watching a conversation earlier on in the Selfish IRC channel where the developer, or the guy who's running this Indiegogo campaign, said, uh, yeah, if you, uh, if you contact WhatsApp to tell them your account's been blocked, don't tell them you use Mitakulu because then they'll block you for life. Mm. Yay. <laughs> okay. So this is sounds this, dodgy. Is this campaign really the best place to put effort? Should we not Well, say- you know, it, it's, it's a nice idea. And, it, you know, if... if if someone wants to develop an app and, and it already exists and so, it's just a case of porting it, that's, that's like, you know, good fun thing to do. When you pay for WhatsApp, you pay to download the app. No, you pay no, you for pay, the subscription, yeah, yeah, don't it's you? Yeah, service. So well, it just makes sense if WhatsApp just let you do it. Right. But I don't know. I think they want to protect their network and, and so on oh, and so on. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, you know, third-party apps that hook in and do strange things. Yeah. Um, I think... But you know, it'd be interesting to see if if they do port this across. I mean, it is open source; it's all free all right. software. So okay. you know, someone could port it, whether it's him or someone else. Um, be interesting to follow. It's only reached thirty five dollars at the last moment I looked at it. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll no, that, that, that is still the case. I've just looked at it just now. Okay, but it's got two months to go or something yeah. like that. So yeah. I'm sure there's enough people who would be uh, happy to uh, chip in a few dollars to maybe make one hundred and twenty. Yeah, I'm sure. Euros. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> uh, Windows has been brought bang up to date with the late 1990s by introducing an app-style package manager called OneGet. Mm. Mm. Yeah. They listened, because that's the reason I didn't go to Windows 7 on my work machine. Well, because it didn't have apt-get. It didn't have apt-get, and it was wow. going to take me forever to set it up. <laughs> so it's it's a command line PowerShell type thing. Yeah. So you can do one get install VNC for VLC for example, and it'll go and get VLC or whatever other package from there. I think they call them repos or repositories <laughs> or something no, like that. No, I, I don't. I don't really one understand get Ubuntu. this. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, <laughs> brilliant idea. Someone there. should put an Ubuntu inside oh, their repo. <laughs> Like downloads the Wubi installer. Yeah, downloads the Wubi installer. <laughs> yeah. Or downloads like a VM or something and just boots it up. There you go. Job Amazing. Done. Yeah. Uh, it's part of PowerShell, available in Windows 10 Technical Preview Ooh. or the Windows Management Framework 5 Preview for Windows 8.1. So, And this is this is made by a guy who we met, actually. in oh, right. We met in Dublin, you and I. <laughs> okay. Uh, some years ago when Laura Tchaikovsky Ch- uh, set up a... Was it OSS Bar Camp? Yes. Uh, you mean Davey you went over? You mean Davey? Yeah. Yes. No. I went to one of them, but not that one. Not <laughs> so that this, one, no. This one. He, uh, he, Is that the one working. where Davey forgot his pack? His... There's lots of stories about Davey. <laughs> the suitcase. There's lots of things, things that Davey forgot yes. that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and things we'd like to forget. <laughs> so um, the guy the guy who, uh, who, who created this or is running the project has been doing this for a number of years so we've we've heard about him developing this and i've, I've often wondered you know what is he, is he actually ever going to finish this thing is it ever going to actually be delivered and now it's on github and you can you can grab the code and oh cool you know, it's integrated into the next version of windows so wow. yeah, that's good work he's worked hard on that and good to see it come to fruition yeah i think it says it's been working on it as you say for a number of years wow it, it have been releases of windows since we spoke to him those all those mm. years ago. Yeah, two thousand and eight was it? Yes, yeah, so we have what Windows Seven at least. Yeah, um, but Windows Eight. Is, I, I guess 8. this 1. is quite a fundamental change to, and you know, it took everyone else to do it to create an app store type thing. Yeah, you know, and a system of installing packages from a repository. Even like OS Ten has an app store now built into the desktop, and right. you know, all the mobile platforms have it as well. And you know, well done Microsoft for keeping up. Oh. Yeah. And finally, we do have a piece of gaming news. Uh, well, I think, I think we're out of time. No, no we're not. We've, We've got, got plenty minutes. of time. Three uh, minutes. Uh, uh, Stop uh, complaining and talk. I think if you look closer, you'll see we're just about out of time. So uh, three if, if you look closer, you'll be able to read the news. Uh, I don't read this stuff, Mark. I know this <laughs> stuff. Well, just <laughs> well, know this. Us. <laughs> okay, well, the uh, Humble Indie Bundle 13 has launched, as uh, anybody who 
knows anything will be aware, um, which marks the 100th game ported to Linux by Humble Bundle Inc. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, um, so in a celebratory blog post, they've um, talked about the idea of multi-platform releases becoming the rule rather than the exception. Um, and they've provided some statistics for the differences in prices paid by uh, by platform for humble, humble bundles, which right. is so you know, if you're Mac people versus Windows people versus uh, Linux people. Cool. So this is on average over the whole lot then, rather than just because you can always see, there's always a graph on each campaign where you can see how much people are paying. But this is mm. like an average of all of the humble bundles. Oh right. Okay. Including yeah. the ones that are Windows oh, only. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's only the humble indie bundles. Is, it, if, <laughs> is this over the hundred games bundles? The, the, I think this is over over the humble indie bundles, which are the where these hundred games are coming from. Yes, thirteenth of this of right. which this is thirteenth. Uh, okay, yeah. Well, I don't want to bore you with too much detail, but on average, okay. Linux customers have paid one dollar more than Mac OS. That doesn't customers. sound like that a lot. That doesn't sound like a lot now. And two dollars sixty more but than then, Windows. I don't know if you look at the average price. It probably as a proportion of the amount paid, it's quite a lot more. Yeah, I think that number would be more significant if we'd used a percentage difference. Rather well, than they didn't give a percentage of... difference. No, we could have not? worked it out, sure. No. <laughs> so what games are in this latest bundle then, Tony? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that, Alan. Um, <laughs> the latest bundle, <laughs> which is called Insanely Twisted Shadow Planet, Risk of Rain and Tower of Guns. Those are some of the games. Um, oh, interesting. They they are obviously um, and obviously more games coming soon if you pay over this. Yes. I think I think it's a yeah, sort of yeah, Halloween yeah. horror themed. Ah. It's, it, they, it's it's styled as the in die bundle. Wow, you sound more knowledgeable about this than Tony does. I, I, oh, I don't know. I don't. I don't really play games. It's oh. a, a false. It's a false impression. <laughs> um, Risk of Rain is a, a weather app. It shows you um, <laughs> what the weather's going to be like where where you go. Is it really um, spelt like that? Yep. Risk, R-I-S-K, <laughs> and Rain, R-A-I-N. Um, I won't go into the details about the other ones, but they... Uh, you can they... find out more at HumbleBundle.com, I yeah, guess. Yeah, everybody knows that, yeah. Yeah. Is that the end of the Ooh, news? I believe it is. Excellent. The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that pleases, puzzles, or piques you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. And now it's time for your community news. And the first item in the community news, uh, following a request from the own cloud developer, Lucas Resky, and uh, discussions with the technical board, the own cloud packages are to be removed from the Ubuntu Universe repository. Dun, dun, dun. Whoa. Yes. Okay, why? Uh, so one of the problems with the uh, repository is that once an application goes in, you have two options if it's broken. Well, you have three options, really. Uh, one is you leave it alone. Uh, and the second option, really, actually, maybe only two options. Uh, the second option is you update it. That's it. You, you, either, you either leave it broken or you fix it. That's, that's the two options. And it seems the own cloud developers didn't have the resources to have someone maintain those packages in the Ubuntu repository. And because they're already in, and we don't allow them to be removed from the repository once the release has gone out. We don't rip packages out of the repository. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a bit of discussion on the tech board mailing list where the developer said, hey, can you remove it from the archive? And the answer was, well, actually, no, we can't, because that's the policy decision is we don't, we don't remove stuff from the archive. It's in there and it stays in there. Um, so what you should do is find someone to update it. And there was a bit of back and forth and there was a bit of grumpiness from uh, from the own cloud guys, I think there was a bit of a misunderstanding communication problem. Um, so it's been removed from the archive from um, fourteen ten onwards, mm-hmm. but it's not retrospectively been removed. So if you're on like fourteen oh four, for example, and you app get installed own cloud, then you're inst- installing a broken. Isn't there version. some? Yeah, you know, can't you like have some sort of blacklist for these things if something's found to have like a major? Well, no, people should update it. The developer should put a new version out. And, and fix it. That's that's the answer. Well, you don't, don't, you don't leave there. broken packages in the archive and then tell people not to install them. 
you fix them. That's the whole point of having what, a repository. If, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what the situation was here, but if it security could, issues. No, no, no. Sorry, I mean, um, why they couldn't update it? Yeah, I mean, if somebody else decided to package their software and put it in the archive. And they've got, I mean, the way that they, they package their software is they have their stuff in the OpenSUSE build service, mm-hmm. which is doing their package builds for them. Right. So if someone else is going to build a package and put it in the archive and then they discover that it's not being maintained and they still don't, they don't have the resource to maintain it and they never did, that's not really their fault. No, so they should find someone to do that. Right. Uh, which is exactly what happens in Debian and Ubuntu is that someone packages the application and and puts it, in the archive and maintains it and you have a commitment from someone it's it's not a small commitment you know to maintain something for you know a number of months or a number of years um it's you know it's it's a significant amount of work and someone needs well there to you do go it. but you're saying you're saying they should just do that no i'm saying they should find someone yeah but to do that but you're also saying it's a significant amount of work so they might not be able to find someone to do that they might not but it seems to me they didn't f- try <laughs> it seems to me they complained and said rip it out the archive rather than go and find people who want to maintain it. Who put it in there in the first place? Uh, I think it came in from the sync from Debian. I think it's in Debian, and at the beginning of a release, we synchronized some packages in from Debian, so it came from whoever put it into Debian. So so if it comes out of the archive, what happens if somebody's already installed it? Then they already have it installed. It doesn't break it? Nope. Well, we don't rip it out. That's the point. If you're running 1404, if you're running LTS... Um, the pa- and you installed the package, then you have the package installed. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't get any well updates. Done. But it doesn't right. get any updates. You won't get any updates, and it's possibly got security problems. To be fair, this isn't. Uh, um, I mean, I've seen this before, particularly with the web applications. Right. So uh, all the versions of Ubuntu have WordPress like one yeah. dot yeah. x in them. WordPress, Moodle, yeah. Drupal, all sorts of stuff. Exactly. Where if you go on the website for them, they say, "Do not install it from your distros yeah, repository." Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. What's the point of putting them in the distros if they're not going to open? Because it? back then, at the time, people thought, hey, wouldn't it be good if I could just up get install WordPress on my server? Da-da, and now I've got WordPress, or whatever web app, yeah? And then, you yes, know, some time passes, and nobody's there to keep that thing maintained. The person who did has maybe, you know, family commitments, changed their job, or whatever, personal reasons, has decided to no longer maintain that package. And so, so I wasn't we end up listen- with orphaned packages. I wasn't listening to the bit at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get when, the staff. When you say they won't take it out, they won't take it out forever for no, all no, future they won't. releases. No, 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 they won't release. take. They won't take it out from the archive for releases that have already gone already from gone. the past. Okay, right. it's now removed from future, future releases. So if you if you're running fourteen ten or above, the app get installed only cloud won't work. There'll be nothing there. Okay. I mean, what they could do is maybe update the package and point people at the open build service or a PPA or something mm-hmm. like that. But the fact is that's. Not what's happened. (laughs) So users are recommended to use the official repository hosted by the OpenSUSE build service. Yes, that's that's, what I use. That's where Cloud point to, yeah. Right, okay. Excellent. Mm. Mm. And Randall Ross is the newest Ubuntu community manager. Mm. That's taken over from Jono? No. No. He's a community manager, not the community manager. manager. Oh, of course. Yes. So, yeah. How many community managers have you got now? Uh, Five. Are you their big boss? No. Oh. I'm not the boss. David Planella is the oh. head of the community team, but but he's not the community manager. <laughs> yeah, well, they're all community managers. So they're all community managers doing different things. Right. Um and Randall joined on the cloud side of the business, so he's doing kind of juju and cloudy kind of stuff, community mm-hmm. management over there. Okay. Um he doesn't work with us on the community team confusingly enough. Right. He, he See, this is what that you're on the community team. Yeah. But so, you're not a community kind of. manager. But, and you're a manager yeah. on you the community, community team, team but yeah. you're not... The manager of the community You're not That's the manager. That's David Planella. Right. Yes. <laughs> you're, you're so a... who are you? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> After all these years, we finally we, we should We should probably interview you one week about your job. And the yeah, organisation structure. <laughs> yeah, it's confusing. Can you draw us a diagram? Yeah. So welcome, Randall, to the team. Yes. Cool. So he's, well, do, he's, he's doing, doing cloud stuff. Yeah, cloudy cloud, juju, that kind of stuff that we don't quite understand. <laughs> <laughs> and every time We've we interview have to people ask. about it, I think we should yeah, understand. We, we should well. probably listen to those episodes again. <laughs> yeah. Every single time. Cloud. So what's a juju? <laughs> yeah, we all zone out when they talk about cloud, cloudy cloud, 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 whatever. You I shouldn't know. have to care about it because it just works. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, same as the desktop. Yeah. Uh, Unless it's an own cloud. Finally, in the community news this week, <laughs> the Ubuntu Developer Tool Center now has support for Eclipse and Android ADT. Wee! That's super. 
How exciting. Yeah. So and there's more stuff will be added that people can put in requests for what what developer tools you want added to the uh, developer tool center. What could you use before that? Uh, so before Didrox made this tool, uh, the whole idea of this tool is to make it easy for a developer to install the tools they need to do their job. Mm-hmm. And he initially, I think he added what's it called, uh, Android Studio. Yeah. Is it Android Developer Studio or something? Yeah, yeah Android uh, Studio. Yeah. Um, he's now added Eclipse because some people use Eclipse rather than Android Studio. So it's making it easier for developers to install Ubuntu and then run this command and then, boop, you've got everything you need Android to be an Android Studio developer. is Eclipse. No. It is. No, it's not. It is. <laughs> sight, sight, It's sight. just Eclipse with Android Developer Tools plugins. Is it? Are you sure? Yeah. I've it's got not. it. It's IntelliJ. Is it? Yes. Oh. Eclipse is Eclipse. Yeah, I know what Eclipse is. Yeah, that's not Eclipse. <laughs> that's not what I've got. Yeah, you probably I've have I've got Eclipse the Eclipse then. one. Right. There we go. <laughs> Which was added to the uh, Ubuntu right. Developer Tools Centre. Cool. And yes. very quickly, we have one event. Yeah, uh, Ubuntu Online Summit, 12th to the 14th of November. Uh, uh, join us. Go to summit.ubuntu.com and find out more. Cool. Yay. <laughs> That's it. Well done, Mark. Yes, Thank well you. done, you. Yes, well done. Seamless, right? <laughs> yep. yep. yep it's not so easy, is it? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. I am never doing this. <laughs> All these years uh, of mockery. That I've <laughs> um, anyway, so that's, that's yeah. it. For Stick around. Episode thirty-one. At half past eight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stick around for the next episode if you're listening live. Um, otherwise, we'll be back next week, won't we? Yes. See you yes, then. We will. Bye. 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 bye, 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 bye.